Let me start off by saying this week and next week's videos may be a bit on the shorter side, as I'm currently in the process of moving and as a result I don't have a lot of time to focus on videos. That said, I didn't want to leave you guys with nothing, so I thought now would be the perfect time to get to a couple of the shorter challenges that have been suggested in the past. With that in mind, today it's time to find out, can you beat Fallout 4 with an unmodded pipe pistol? Anyone who has played Fallout 4 before knows that the pipe pistol is one of the worst guns in the game, especially without any modifications. It is so unremarkable in fact that the 10mm pistol you get at the beginning is better than it, so it mostly just serves as a weapon to give low level raiders so they don't hurt the player too much during the game's opening hours. If there is one good thing I can say before starting the run, it's that the 38 ammo for the pistol is fairly common and cheap, so at the very least I shouldn't need to worry about running out of ammo. It should also go without saying that gun bashing is not allowed, as I already have a whole video doing just that. Now, with all that out of the way, let's begin. Building my character is pretty straightforward. You are required by the game to have at least one point in every stat regardless, so I will always have access to the Gunslinger perk as it's one of the only ways I'll be able to increase my damage over the course of the run. I also make sure to have 5 in luck to have access to the bloody mess perk, as well as being able to build up crits faster in fats, and for what it's worth when I leave the vault I also use the book in Sean's room to bump my luck up to 6. Then I just put the last of my points into perception and endurance for the defensive perks that both of these trees can offer. As they say a good offense is a great defense, but I won't have much in the way of deadly firepower, so I'll need to counteract that by becoming a tank. Making my way out of the vault and I immediately head for this house at the very end of Sanctuary as it is one of the locations that an unmodded pipe pistol will spawn no matter what. I take a moment to scavenge around Sanctuary and in doing so manage to find a total of 25 bullets. It's not a lot as of yet but I managed to almost double it right away as the dead raider just outside of town happens to be in possession of another 21 rounds. 46 bullets is honestly more than I thought that I would find before heading into my first fight, so for the time being I am quite optimistic. As mentioned at the beginning, pipe weapons are favoured by low level raiders and seeing as we are at the very start of the game, the raiders in Concord are an absolute gold mine when it comes to free ammo. Each of these raiders go down to 2 or 3 shots at most, and any of the ones that are currently carrying pipe weapons carry somewhere between 10 and 14 bullets each, meaning that while I may need to use some of my own ammo to take them out, I will be making a substantial amount more back in the process. After dealing with all of the raiders in the street and searching some of the nearby buildings, I managed to collect just under 100 bullets. While this would definitely be enough to take out the rest of the raiders in the Museum of Freedom, I wasn't so sure about the Death Claw. So for once I decided to head down the road to do some trading with Carla and purchased another 98 from her, thanks to the caps I made selling all the armour and weapons from the raiders. Still not satisfied, I helped Trudy get rid of Wolfgang and Simone, and then used the money she gave me to feed my apparent addiction to 38 rounds with another 49 bullets. As ready as I could ever be, I took the fight to the raiders back at the museum, and thanks to my insane amount of ammo for the early game, coupled with me levelling up and getting the first rank in the gunslinger perk, I was able to clear them out with no trouble. I then offered to continue to help out Preston, despite the fact I didn't feel like siding with the Minutemen this time around. In fact, while I fight the Deathclaw, let's go over my thought process for what faction I'll be siding with. To start with, I don't want to side with the Institute again as I went with them last time during the Deathclaw video. The real road has you spend the majority of your time undercover, meaning it's pretty similar to the Institute, so they also don't seem all that appealing to me. The Minutemen may be the fastest way to finish the game as their settlement quests are fairly short, plus I'll get a lot of ammo from my gun fighting off raiders and super mutants. But the Minutemen also have one of the single longest and most difficult penultimate missions ever where you have to defend the castle from seemingly never ending waves of synths and coursers, and the thought of attempting that with a pipe pistol honestly makes me feel ill. All that leaves is the Brotherhood of Steel. The biggest hurdle I can think of for them is taking out the mutants at Fort Strong, and while fighting a behemoth sounds like a death wish, I'm not going to sit here and pretend like their AI can't be exploded to hell and back to make things easier. The Brotherhood's mass fusion mission is also a lot easier than the Institute's version of the same quest, as Ingram hits like a truck and can also take a surprising amount of punishment, therefore acting like an effective meat shield. Well anyway, with the Deathclaw dead and my mind made up about who I was going to follow to the end of the game, I began to head south towards Cambridge. I may also have made a quick pit stop in the Corvega assembly plant to wipe out Jared and his band of raiders so that I could collect even more ammunition. It took a while to cut through them all, but by the time I was finished I had over 500 rounds for the pipe pistol. Clearly overcompensating with my ammo count, I meet up with Dance and head off to Arcjet, where I won't even pretend like I did any of the work as Dance turned them all into ashen ones. I then get my reward of caps in the form of a laser rifle, and am now officially a member of the Brotherhood of Steel. With that little initiation test out of the way, it was time to make my way for Diamond City. On the trip I ended up hoarding more ammo from the raiders who may or may not be pirates on the boats just underneath the bridge. 
I was a little concerned about their leader in the suit of power armor, but a few shots to the head along with a critical in there somewhere helped to trivialise the fight. I mentioned briefly before that super mutants are also a fairly good source of 38 rounds, so with that in mind, I do take the time to help out the Diamond City security just outside of town. They can take more punishment than your average raider, so it's hard to really say whether I will actually gain ammo from fighting them or just break even. No time to ponder the finer details of loading my victims as I put a bullet straight into Piper's head to quickly make my way into town. I had briefly considered about bringing her along as her name is Piper after all and she does use a pistol so in a weird way she could fit the rules but alas shooting her point blank in the face upon our first meeting didn't exactly leave the best lasting impression. I'm going to be honest I'm not actually sure why I didn't skip the Diamond City part and just move straight on to Park Street Station. On the bright side it did mean I could purchase some ammo and healing supplies before facing the Triggerman, I just had to wait around for a while until the citizens stop having an incident. Right before entering the subway station to save Nick, I had the ever so bright idea to fight Swan as an almost test run to see how I would fare against the mandatory behemoth encounter later on. Unsurprisingly I get hit so hard that my skeleton shot straight out through my toes and died almost immediately. Being humbled and put in my place it was down into the station to fight the zombie gangsters. This is the first real encounter where I won't be getting ammo back with every kill. You could count arc jet sure, but I at least had dance along for the ride to do most of the dismantling, this time it's just me. Thankfully for me, the trigger men aren't all that smart, which is no more apparent than this one pretending to hold a gun until I approach him. To be honest, taking them out is wildly inconsistent. Some of them will go down in 2 or 3 bullets, much like the early game raiders, and then others will require me to hip fire over half of my clip into them before they go down. Either way, it doesn't take long for me to reach Nick and then shoot our way back out. When it comes time to face Skinny Malone, my horrible accuracy ended up proving useful as while I missed most of my shots on him, I was fortunate enough that they found their way into one of his bodyguards behind him. As I still have over 400 bullets to spare, Skinny Malone was never going to make it out of this encounter without looking like a block of Swiss cheese. With that it was back to Diamond City and to slightly switch things up I instead stole the key to Kellogg's house from the mayor's safe instead of his receptionist. Truly the multiple ways to handle a single situation are staggering. I also paid Piper a visit and as expected she has yet to forgive me about the whole bullet lodged in the back of her brain situation. Honestly I should have expected as much as I have played New Vegas after all. Anyway back to the plot and it's time to assault Fort Hagen and throw myself at the synths yet again. I have enough energy resistance thanks to my armour and perks that I'm honestly not worried about dying, but more so I am concerned as to how bullet spongy they can be, especially given the current circumstances of this challenge. I could sit here and explain each encounter and how they went, but I think the best indication of how this unfolded is that I entered the fort with around 500 bullets and when the time finally came where I put the last round into Kellogg, I was down to 103. What this means is that I had to do the rounds and spent a ridiculous amount of money on more ammo. Thankfully all of the fusion cells I got from the synths can help to cover some of the costs. I return one final time to Nick's office where I'm glad to see Piper not wanting to beat me to death with my own spine. The walk to Good Neighbour is a safe one and after wasting ammo on Finn I get to tap dancing my way through Kellogg's seemingly random memories that do a bad job of making me care. After I get out I learn two things, one that it's time to get irradiated and two that you don't even have to talk to Nick on the way out and you can in fact just leave him here seemingly forever. I will not bore you with the details of the glowing sea, for there are none. I didn't fight anything and I didn't even bother to cure my radiation until I made it to Virgil. Turns out sprinting straight through even with incredibly low action points is still a valid option. After agreeing to help the green man from the green sea I head off to the green tech building to fight the green gunners. I feel I'm at the point in the game now where the 38 rounds are starting to get phased out as I don't find all that many when making my way up the building. So it looks like I will need to loot as much as I can as trading for them seems to be my only valid option. The gunners aren't all that tough so long as I take things slow. That said, I ended up having to make most of the journey twice due to a very slow and unfortunate death. The Courser is just the same as Kellogg except instead of a revolver, he now carries an automatic institute pistol. If that sounds like it wouldn't change the fight all that much, well you would be correct. In fact, in my opinion it makes it easier as at least Kellogg had backup. Well with the second brain chip this playthrough in my possession it was now time to do my absolute favourite thing in these runs, exterminate the railroad. It's not that I hate them more than any of the other factions, I just like the idea that some random wastelander stumbles upon their secret hideout and decides to immediately open fire and murder them with an incredibly weak weapon. As per usual Desdemona goes down pretty fast as I fire blindly into the darkness followed by a few others including Drummer Boy. 
Glory put up the most fight, which is to be expected given the fact she has a minigun and an armoured railroad coat that I will be taking as it is far better than any of my armour even by this point in the game. Deacon was probably the most anticlimactic as he didn't really say anything or react to what was happening, nor did he really try very hard to fight back now that I think about it. All that left was a few nameless agents along with Carrington and Tinker Tom. The best part about all of this is of course the supplies I can now procure from the base, that mainly being a decent amount of free stim packs and right away. For once I managed to halt my bloodlust and actually spare Pam so that I can come back and get her later on seeing how I know I'll be siding with the Brotherhood. Speaking of, I believe it is now time to take the free vertebrate ride to the Pridwin. The first part of the meet and greet is fairly straightforward stuff so I choose to entertain myself by repeatedly picking up and throwing this globe at Maxon while he gives his overly long speech. I have literally put this off for as long as I possibly can, but if I wish to still side with the Brotherhood and build the teleporter, I will need to attack Fort Strong now. I spend a little while running around and buying as much ammo as physically possible before making my way into hell. Right before the bridge into the fort I find half a suit of T-51 power armour that I got inside to put to good use. Why I hear you ask, didn't I take the free suit currently waiting for me aboard the Prudwin? Good question. As I enter the fight I was initially going to just hard focus on the behemoth, but after getting shot from just about every direction possible, I shifted my plans to instead focus on the smaller mutants for the time being. The normal run of the mill suit mutants are pretty simple enough and even drop some 38 ammo which is always nice. But because the behemoth clearly wasn't enough, the game also decided to throw in a legendary super mutant butcher just to spice things up. He isn't able to inflict all that much damage to be fair as he too only has a pipe weapon. The issue just lies in the fact I have to waste a lot of bullets in order to take him down. All that leaves is me and the behemoth, and do you remember what I said earlier about cheesing the AI? Well I ended up doing it accidentally because that's just the way these games work. My strategy was going to be similar to my previous Brotherhood runs where I just lure him around the broken building in circles all the while shooting him until he eventually goes down. However, I never needed to do that as when I stood in this exact spot, for some reason he would not approach me and would only very rarely throw rocks at me, and even when he did, they never seemed to hit me directly but instead would hit a part of the ground either just in front or behind me. Sure it may not have been the most exciting fight having to play out this way, but honestly if it saves me healing supplies and ammo, I'm all for it. Compared to the slog fest that was chipping away at that behemoth, the mutants inside felt like an absolute cakewalk. Sure, there were a few more higher rank ones than outside, but nothing to be too worried about. After I was finished playing around the bodies I returned to Maxon, built the teleporter, met with Father, and rather than shoot him and leave, made an effort to actually go down and meet the other members of the Institute so that I could convince Dr. Lee to return to the Brotherhood. I of course lacked the necessary charisma to outright persuade her, so I made a mad dash through the FEV lab to grab Virgil's notes instead. Shockingly, this only actually resulted in one death by having my stomach aggressively rubbed by an assault trunk. With Lee now back in the not so caring arms of the Brotherhood of Steel it was on to the back and forth between her and Ingram, which thankfully did not take too long as I have made a mental note to buy the high powered magnet as soon as I first set foot in Diamond City from now on. After that's taken care of it's back to the coolest part of Fallout 4 as it's time to find some nukes for the Patriot robot back down in the glowing sea. I thought for a moment that I may have found either a friendly or blind deathclaw concerned how close I was able to get to this one. But I took one step too many it seems as I pissed him off for some reason and as such it was time for another jog through the mutation zone. The incredibly ominous pyramid that houses the nukes is filled with feral ghouls, but they have remained some of the most consistently simple enemies to take out that I have yet to even mention any encounters with them up until now. Simply put, they don't have a lot in the way of defence, obviously, and therefore go down with just a few shots. And should I be unlucky enough to encounter some of the higher rank versions, I can just shoot off one of their legs to trivialise the fight even further. The real issue in here was right before the room of the nukes there's a child of Adam, but more importantly his Assaultron bodyguard who as you can imagine is able to eviscerate me in a matter of seconds should it get too close. I even tried an old trick of luring the glowing one from the lift out to hopefully do some damage, but yet again this proves to be a rather pointless attempt as the ghoul is stopped pretty fast. What ended up working was that I could take out the child of Adam first, which would then aggro the Assaultron, and then I could run back through the way I came, creating some distance between the two of us, allowing me to get a few shots off before she could close the gap. This also allowed me to avoid her death beam as right when I could hear she was about to fire, I could take cover around one of the corners in the tunnels. It took a little bit but I was able to emerge victorious. I then marked the nukes for pickup and returned to Maxon where he of course insults me by saying I was aware Dance was a synth, which is absurd as I have only ever spoken to the man a handful of times. Well I guess it's time to speak to him one final time as I then put him down with a single shot to the head. I could have tried to convince him to live, but at the end of the day I'm not allowing myself to use companions so there would be no point. 
As I get congratulated by Maxon, I am finally reminded about the suit of power armor that is literally just waiting for me and immediately make my way to put it to good use. There is no point in me going over the railroad as I have already cleared them out, so it was on to mass fusion where it was yet again time to waste bullets on more synths. Much like when I was with Dance and Arcjet, I stand there and try my best to fight off the synths, but Engram ends up charging in and stealing most of the kills. Seeing how she is so eager to be the centre of attention, I let her do all the fighting on the way down the elevator while I conserved ammo. Thanks to my power armour, I don't even have to grab the radiation suit and can just mosey on over and scoop out the agitator without a care in the world. I tried my best to fight the sentry bot and even managed to get the kill on it. Sure, Ingram was the one he was focusing on, therefore allowing me to unload into him without the fear of retaliation, but it was a team effort. When the Assaultrons arrive I once again open fire, but by this point Ingram is back on her feet and clears them out in no time. I then get the agitator back to prime and now it's time for the final battle. On my last go around to get ammo I didn't actually have much money to spare so I wasn't able to get much to work with. I still did my best to engage in as many fights as I could, but yet again the Brotherhood made it so that my efforts were mostly pointless. I was at least smart enough to save a bullet for Sean, as well as some for the surviving scientists in the reactor room. Luckily for me, the game doesn't require you to actually clear out every single enemy, otherwise I'd be in a bit of a sticky situation. So as soon as I strapped the pulse charge on the reactor, I teleported myself to safety, destroyed the institute, threatened Maxon with an empty gun, finishing the game, and proving yes, you can indeed beat Fallout 4 with an unmodded pipe pistol. This is usually the part where I leave my final thoughts on how the run went, and all I can think of is that it probably would have been a lot easier if it was a stealth based build, and if I had in fact sided with the Minuteman after all. Regardless, it's going to be the next challenge video. If you enjoyed what you saw, consider going to video a like, if you're interested in more challenges in the future, feel free to subscribe, start up on these videos. I have a week, my name is Nerds. I say, I want to see you all in the next video.